That's fine. Okay. Ready? One, two. Tark Murad, how you doing? I'm good, bro. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How's the off season so far? It's been good. Um, thankfully, the season didn't end prematurely. At least uh, we made playoffs, so it didn't seem as long as it, as it maybe might have felt if we had ended the season without qualifying for playoffs. But That's funny, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can go into it real quick. It yeah, came down to decision day. It did. Oakland Roots, it did. you guys played against Pittsburgh, but you played earlier in the day. We did, So yes. we were waiting to see what your result was going to be. You win, uh-huh. you're in. If, right. if uh, you guys win, we don't even have a chance. Uh-huh. I think if you had tied two, maybe. If we... I think we just needed a point, maybe. Okay. So the point happened. You guys didn't get the point. You lost 3-1. We go to our game against Galaxy that night. Yeah. And I think you guys, you said you were watching it from the hotel. You were oh watching it. Oh, my God. It. Watching it everywhere. <laughs> Everyone's just on their phones the whole time. It was <sighs> it was hectic. That was cool. I think for, for our Las Vegas team, last year we were so bad. Yeah. And this year to have it go down to the last day was right. a, a different dynamic for us, I think, even as coaches. Yeah. Like trying to manage the group and say, hey, like, yeah, we have this game to watch in, in the day, but don't for let sure. that really interfere with your preparation but yeah you guys did have a good run the last two years now with oakland roots you guys have i think you you made it you made your penalty against oc no orange you, county yeah but you guys year. you guys lost that game we lost we lost in that same shootout later okay. on in the shootout but yeah okay and then yeah. this past year you guys beat san diego which was like a, a big favorite for right. for probably winning the whole thing and you right. guys ended up beating them at their place uh-huh man and then we got smacked <laughs> <laughs> score wise but like you know, the score, I mean, at least in my opinion, obviously I played the game, so maybe I'm a bit biased, but yeah. I don't think it was a reflection of actually how the game went, but that's how it goes sometimes, yeah. you know? And you're going into your 10th year now as a pro? 10th season coming up. How do you view your off season now as it almost going into your 10th year versus maybe your first few years in the league? Oh man, it's completely transformed for sure. One, I just got to know my body better. Uh, I got a better understanding of what I need uh, to be able to show up to preseason feeling fresh, feeling fit, feeling feeling sharp. Or maybe my first few seasons as a professional, I was definitely going at it pretty hard. I maybe had given myself a week or two of like some time off, and then I would like be playing and touching the ball every day. Not that I wouldn't do that now, but not to that level of intensity where I'm just not really allowing my muscles to fully repair and recover after eight, nine, ten months of just, you know, ground and pound wear and tear. So it's transformed uh, for the better, for sure. I'm still learning. I'm still growing and I'm still kind of fine tuning my off season kind of routine. And I, I think I feel really good going into this preseason coming soon, pretty much. Yeah, it's quick, quick it's turnaround. Crazy, isn't it? For us coaches, it's tough because we have like now it's back to session planning, scouting and all yeah. that. And then for you guys as well, I'm sure putting right. your body through the season's very long. Right. Um, but uh, I feel you've always been someone. I mean, now that I've, I mean, we grew up with each other. So I think yeah. break the fourth wall for everybody here. But we've <laughs> known each other for a very long time. Yeah. Um, but you've always, I feel like you've always been someone who's taken care of themselves with their routine. You've always taken care of your nutrition. Yeah. Um, but the big one, I think, is that like, I feel like you're always, you're very hard on yourself. You self critique a lot. So how was that yeah. self self critique process coming into this off season? Was it, uh, hey, maybe give my mind a little bit of a break and then we look back and see what we could have done better? Right. Or right away were you like, ah, oh, man. I got to improve on this, this, and this, and set that uh, foundation in the preseason. So it's changed, you know, obviously just the, the longer my career has gone on, you know, you, you have a little bit more emotional maturity instead of maybe being overcritical or being, you know, hyper self-critical of myself. Maybe I'm just more reflective of, of things that I've done that I can do better. So it's just a different kind of approach. You know, it's not really rooted more in like in almost negativity. It's kind of more rooted in like, hold on, let me take a second. Let me be a little bit more objective and neutral and kind of approach this uh, without as much emotion just so I can accomplish, you know, whatever it is that I've identified that I probably need to improve on and then attack it from an angle where um, I'm not as emotional and it'll help me kind of, you know, structure a process to getting better at whatever that thing is. Uh, a little bit easier so not that I'm not still super self-critical of myself I think that's a part of me which will always probably be there it's probably like I said I probably turn the dial down in terms of you know what emotion is actually being used uh, for me to to actually attack those 
things that I that yeah. I want to improve on I- I- in a way. So yeah, it's it's definitely changed over the years, but I would still say I'm pretty self critical. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, you have to be. So before you were a 10 year vet now in, in the pro game, uh, you started with here in Chino Hills with I Arsenal did. Academy. I did. What were the early days like for you? Because you were a, a center defensive mid. I was a CDM growing up, but then as I started to get older, probably you 15, you 16, you 17, then then I was transitioning into a center back, and so. <clears throat> playing as a six, you know, the types of qualities a uh, number six needs, you know, he has to be a good distributor. Um, he has to have good awareness and good positioning on the field. Uh, he has to break up plays. He has to read the game really well. So a lot of the, a lot of those qualities helped me kind of transition to a center back where now I have the whole field in front of me more or less. And now I can almost play a role that's somewhat similar I would say they're not always interchangeable, those two positions, especially depending on the personnel. But it definitely helped me. Now I was, now I was a center back who was a lot more technical, uh, probably a lot more tactical in that I know what the job requirements were of that position. So mm-hmm. that helped me help that person when it came time for me to be a center back in a way. So definitely playing those positions kind of, going back and forth between the two definitely helped me in my development process, I would say for sure. Yeah. I mean, you were always good with your feet. I remember, Yeah. well, again, there's so many stories that we can get to, but I just, uh, (laughs) for example, there was like an LA Galaxy USL when they kind of first started Uh and I was at that camp, you were at that camp. Right. And I remember, I was think I was either playing against you or with you in that, in one of the, like the scrimmages I and i remember going like oh my god i maybe i haven't watched closely enough but your comfort right. on the ball your little deception your little head fakes <laughs> all those little things i was like man this guy you can tell in isolation which i think sometimes can be a little bit difficult for players especially in the goalkeeping sphere right where they say in isolation let's try and make it all related to the game but i feel like when you're in the game there's a flow and then mm-hmm. when you can actually dial like strip it back by layer yeah. you can recognize oh i didn't do this properly so what is that isolated technique that i could do uh-huh. that i could do in isolation fix that and then when it's in the flow of the game right. it makes sense and i feel like your little deception is little head fakes or your little like i don't know cruyff turns and i feel <laughs> like you always found a way to get into the mindset of the person pressuring you uh-huh. and like kind of what they're thinking and then being one step ahead and showing them what they think they want to see and then having a completely different outcome. So for you, right. like how important maybe was training in isolation, but like those little head fakes, little deceptions for anyone who was maybe a six or maybe a center back. Uh-huh. I mean, speaking from my own experience, I've never been a player that let's say a scout was watching me that was ever um, identified by physical attributes. I never been big in the general sense. I've never been strong in the general sense. I've never been fast in the general sense. And so throughout the scouting process, um, those are like big identifiers, you know, immediately. And so I've always had to find other ways to try to get myself um, to be seen and, and stand out in a way. And you have to, or else you're just, you know, fall amongst the crowd and you'll never be seen and so me being able to be um, a little bit intelligent creative a little crafty in a position which players in that position it's not necessarily known for them to be you know those have those types of qualities i needed that that helped me stand out for sure in a way you know obviously you have you need so many other qualities and characteristics about you know any player to really you know, have a full, complete player, especially going to those types of like combines or trials and stuff like that. Those are already, you know, saturated, super saturated and, and just hard to, to shine in those because everyone's really coming out for their, for their own, uh, you know, well-being. well-being. Exactly. So <laughs> those are really hard to, to, to stand out in. But if you can find those moments where you can be creative and, and a little crafty without overdoing it, yeah. Without without getting to the point where it's like okay now now you're now you're being excessive with everything you're doing you've gone beyond just simple creativity and now you're just going borderline like now you're just trying to show off and mm-hmm. and and doing way too much 
And that's just a negative look. <laughs> so there's a fine line you got to ride, you know. I'm not going to be a center back going out here trying to meg guys, yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to pressure me. I maybe could, <laughs> but I definitely wouldn't want to do that because the risk reward is not mm. worth it for me. So I remember those days. You know, I probably still do the same exact <laughs> head fakes and shimmies or, yep. or whatever I need to do to kind of um, – not only not but not but not really from the place of I need to stand now. It's really for my own benefit, for my team's benefit, um, especially as a center back, you know. I just talking more in a general sense, like anytime I receive the ball and I'm under pressure. Worst case scenario, okay, I go back to the keeper. I go back to you. The best case scenario is me being able to still progress the ball up the field with pressure coming at me. Where I know now, if I beat that initial pressure, there'll, there'll be space higher up the field where my team doesn't need to drop back and lose the space that we already had just gained mm. in our opponent's space, essentially. So these are little things that you know I think about as a center back, and that I try to help younger guys who are now doing their combines and their mm -hmm. trials and things like that. Obviously, you need the technical quality and the understanding uh, within a game to be able to do those things. Yeah, and to do it on the fly you're not thinking about it you're just doing mm -hmm. and so thankfully after doing it for a long <laughs> i would say years and years and years i mean we grew up playing together but it just becomes habitual at that point and mm. in instinctual really what are some good qualities of a center back because i've played with some really good ones and i've played with yeah. some really bad ones and you have guys who are just physical you have guys who are crafty but not very quick and they're making their recovery speed so for you let me just put, paint a scenario because i know we right. have different types of people listening to the podcast it's right. goalkeeping for me obviously but then you right. have the uh the center backs and people who don't want to maybe uh -huh. see so for your experience let's say you're receiving a ball from the left center back to you okay. you're recovering and creating depth and you know creating space away mm -hmm. from him maybe on top of the 18 towards the corner of the 18 yeah and then from there what's the process in your head before you receive the ball what are you doing and then once you receive it what are you doing after that the first thing that pops into my head is where's the space and I mean that in the sense where is, where is the space that my teammate is, where my opponent isn't, where I can help guide us to a position where my team can be successful in advancing the ball up the field. That's my first thought. Where's the pressure coming from is my next thought. And these things are all happening within milliseconds. Then is where's my best pass not the million dollar pass, where's mm -hmm. my best pass? And so that could be a 10 yard pass, just g continuing the flow of, of the pass from the left back to me, maybe back, maybe to the right back or to the keeper, depending on where the pressure is coming from. So it's always where's the space. And that helps you kind of not have that tunnel vision where you're just kind of looking within your five, 10 yard, you know, radius around you and having the awareness and vision of taking a glance of the entire field. I may receive the ball from that left back after dropping back into that space to give him a better angle. I may take a touch out from my feet and hit a 70-yard diag out to the right wing back because that's where the space is mm -hmm. and that's the best pass. It could be a situation like that or it could be a 10-yard pass to the goalkeeper. <laughs> so always yeah. my first initial thought is where's the space and then where's the pressure coming from. Mm. That, that qu first scan is so important because uh -huh. it gives you the data that you need to uh, reflect on in, like you said, in like two, three seconds. Not even right. just, after that, it's your prep touch. And then after that, it's what's the pass that I want to hit. Right. And then it's all the context of the match as well. It's like, are For we sure. winning? Are we losing? Do I need to make this penetrating pass? What's right. the risk versus reward? There's so many things. I think for us as goalkeepers, it's rather it's similar to the center back position because mm -hmm. we are receiving a ball. And once we receive it, that pressure is coming from you guys to us, which is like 10, 12 yards. Right. And then in that like small window, we have to make those passes. So I would for say, sure. I, can, I think I can make a good center back, maybe. But I think defensively, I need to have someone who's in my pairing that's mm -hmm. probably 4'2", 4'3", 40-year-old sprint runner because they need to cover for me. <laughs> um, but before you had all this insight to you, like before you had all this like, I don't know, all this experience and all this wisdom, you were just a kid struggling, like all of us, yeah. trying to get a college to invest in you and trying right. to get to, hey, I want to play D1, and a lot of my teammates are playing D1 too. Right. So you did have an offer. from You had one offer. I had one offer. One offer from UC Riverside. Mm -hmm. Take me through, what was that process of like, okay, I have an offer. Maybe it's not the greatest school in the world, but right. it is an offer. And then what happened after that? 
So that process was tough, especially as a 17-year-old kid. At the time, uh, U.S. Soccer Development Academy wasn't as established. It had just started prior to maybe maybe prior to my senior year of high school, senior season. At the time, high school competition was actually pretty decent. It was. No one else. There was no other competitions going on, so it's not like they were. You know, those best players would be able to be pulled away from the high school competition to the academy. But that. That senior season was kind of the start of that transition. So anyways, I made the decision to keep playing high school soccer uh, because I was having to compete against the older age group and I wasn't getting any playing time for those first maybe like, I don't know, five or six games. So I said, you know what, let me just do a development contract, which is I can play up to a certain number of matches, I want to say, hmm. and then I can keep playing high school soccer. After that season, I remember there was a few guys from Arsenal who were going to sign with UC Riverside because the coach from UC Riverside also coached maybe a club or two within the Arsenal club system. And so he knew me because I was within that Arsenal club system. So he knew me. And so I was excited. I was, oh, I was going to go with my friends, Aaron Long, who's now uh, just signed with LAC and a few other guys that I played with. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Like you said, UCR, not, maybe not the greatest school, maybe. <laughs> but again, it's in the UC system. I know guys going there. So it was, it was going to be comfortable and I was going to be happy. So I got a scholarship offer from the coach there at the time. And the communication sort of dropped after I, I got those initial emails telling me exactly what the scholarship offer was going to be financial-wise, what the whole process was. And I had verbally committed, but for weeks, it was like radio silence after that. I didn't hear back from him. I would reach out to him, get no response. Signing day or national signing day comes around, got no response. I'm like, what is going on? I'm over here rocking like UCR gear (laughs) that I bought myself (laughs) at my high school (laughs) on national. I mean, day. Oh, no. <laughs> Bro. And I still didn't even know 100% if I was going there. And so eventually he gets back to me over email and he tells me, sorry, we actually don't have the scholarship money that we initially offered you, but we would still like you to come out and try out in the spring. And I was like, obviously very hurt by it, but I was just confused, shocked. I had already gone on a visit. Like, I had put all my eggs in one basket, essentially. And it's not like I had a bunch of offers prior to that anyway. So it was obviously very tough to kind of deal with at the time. And so weeks went by. I remember having a a meeting with my parents (laughs) in our living room. And they wanted to sit me down and talk to me like, okay, Tarek, what are you going to do? And so eventually I just got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'll go apply for Cal State Fullerton. I'll just attend as a student, undecided major. Let me just, you know, figure out my life from here, hopefully. And, you know, obviously, you know, once you start, to, once you leave high school, starting that process of that, you know, at summertime, everyone's decided where they're going to go. And, you know, I kind of felt a little lost at the You're time. On an island. Right, pretty yeah. much. And so I'm the youngest of three brothers. And you know my brother Kareem. So mm-hmm. Kareem's my older brother, two years older. At the time, he he left. He had left high school two years prior, and his first year out of call or out of high school, he decided to take a break for a year, uh, not go to college, and to work for a bit, just make some money. And then that next year, he was going to attend a junior college called Mount Sac, and he tore his ACL. I think ACL, MCL, meniscus. He tore a lot of ligaments in his knee. But he had to take a redshirt year. So that next year, he was finally back and healthy. And that was my first year out of high school. And so Kareem was like, well, why don't you just come out and play at Mount Sac with me? The idea of going to junior college after you had a Division One scholarship offer in front of you was hard to, to maybe accept at the mm-hmm. time. And the Mount Sac head soccer coach actually co- coached my oldest brother, Hassan, at Arsenal, <laughs> like back in the day. <laughs> Everything's connected. <laughs> yeah, Everything's connected, man. It's crazy. And so I ended up having to speak to Juan, who was the coach, and he kind of convinced me to come out along with Kareem. And so I ended up just coming out. Um, I played um, some like 
exhibition matches with them against like Cal Poly Pomona and maybe another school or two. And then he said, look, we really want you. You know, we'd love for you to try out. And I was like, damn, I got to go try out now. And so obviously, you know, coming from a high school program, (laughs) it's like, (laughs) you know, most of us that are still playing now are like, should have been the best ones on those teams. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's like an ego check for sure. So it's like, dang, now I got to go try out for this junior college team. I just had a D1 scholarship offer. And so I swallowed my pride. I said, you know what? Kareem's going, we'll just carpool the school together, I guess. I'm just like thinking of like scenario in my head. I'm like, this this could be okay. So I go try out and difficult tryout process. There's like a hundred kids maybe, you know, half of them half of them are are not good not quality. <laughs> and so <laughs> it it's really it's really tough because yeah, again, you have to try to stand out and look good. Thankfully, I already had some familiarity with him. He knew me. I already, you know, he's seen me play, so he knows I'm good. But it's just the process of of me being able to accept that I have to go through this process essentially. Mm-hmm. And so, eventually, cuts get made and dwindles down until I, I make the team. Essentially, throughout this whole process, I still have this UCR crap in the back of my head. Like, damn, I could have been a you know, a D1 school right now playing. I'm over here playing junior college. And not that it affected my work ethic, but it drove my determination from, uh, that was rooted in, in, in like anger and negativity. And not, not that it made me spiteful or anything, spiteful or anything. I just, it, it was very humbling, I would say. And so thankfully, actually the staff at Mount Sac was, it was amazing. We had a performance coach who was like, elite like this guy helped definitely shift my mindset and and really helped me kind of understand what it takes to be a good teammate what it takes to to actually win and how much further I can actually push myself to be greater and he and he really helped open my mind to understanding that you know I'm creating these limitations on myself like why why am I putting my ceiling like over here no you can push that push it more 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 and so he always had this saying he was like you get stronger as you go and we would do these crazy fitness sessions like for preseason we went up to the mountains we went to like Big Bear we did like we did these crazy like trips together but like it was the probably the most rewarding and humbling experience going to a junior college and I would say that was like super uh, transformative and how it it shaped me for the rest of my career. When I was in junior college, I didn't play maybe until after the halfway point of the season. And granted, there's not that many games in a junior college season. Every game is is pretty important. If you want to stand out and get scouted by any D1 schools or any school in general uh, for your university, you need to play. And so how it works in the in the JC system is you don't, you can only play there for two years. So you're either a freshman or a sophomore. The clock is ticking. Right. Clock is ticking, essentially. So if I'm not playing as a freshman who wants to transfer immediately after that first year, you're going to be in trouble if you don't if you don't get some minutes. Let me ask you real quick then. So how are you able to you're getting pushed by the trainer and you're getting obviously a little bit more and more a buy in into the physical side, the mental side and and trying to turn this situation that maybe your ego is like, are we really just not good enough or are we just we just didn't get the opportunity. So you're kind of reconciling through all that. But were you able to continue to keep pushing, even though midway through the season, you're looking at yourself and going, what is all this work for? I'm sitting on the bench and I'm, I'm pushing, I'm getting stronger every day, but right. it's not showing on the field. Like, how are you able to stay in that? It's tough. And honestly, reflecting back on it, I, thankfully, there was a culture there that had already been established that, kind of, that for sure helped me. Without that culture, I'm not sure that and obviously, you know, I don't know because yeah. it thankfully didn't happen. But there was a strong enough culture there of of that team first mentality and showing up to work every day and, and giving maximum effort that helped continue my determination, even though I still wasn't seeing the field much. I was maybe coming in as a sub here and there. It was definitely challenging, but definitely extremely rewarding. Uh, eventually, you know, you knock 
long and hard enough, someone's going to eventually open that door. And so I got my opportunity. I probably got my first start of the season more after the halfway point. And then I kept it. Once I got it, I was like, I'm not losing this. I'm keeping mm. this. Like, you're going to have to rip this from my hands. And so I kept it. Uh, ultimately got to the point where we got to the state championship. We won. At that point, one of my one of my best friends and closest friends um, through high school named Marco Franco, who you know, yeah. he was going to UC Irvine on a, on a scholarship. And so he had mentioned to uh, the UC Irvine program's coach to come, you know, you should check out Mount Sac, you should check out all my friends are, he's actually a good player. So he was putting in a good word for me. And there's there's other coaches at the time from other schools, maybe not as, <laughs> I would say, shiny. Prominent, you know? like, yeah. Prominent. Good, yeah, good programs. So, right. I, I mean, I don't want to <laughs> talk down on them, but, <laughs> sure, sure. you know, going, going or the prospect of going to, like, maybe a UC Irvine was, was priority, you know, for sure my, my top priority. And so, ultimately, it got to the point where we won the state championship. I was a prominent figure playing at the number six for Mount Sac. And I played my role really well. And UC Irvine saw value in me. They ended up offering me a scholarship. I accepted that scholarship. Thankfully, during this whole process, I was taking care of the academic side of things. And I put myself in a position to be able to accept the scholarship and attend that school. Whereas some guys, like, unfortunately, they just didn't have the academic side down. They just couldn't keep their head on straight. It was soccer or, or nothing. But the way this <laughs> this country is structured, you need to take care of your academics unless you're going immediately professional. Yeah. It opens the doors for everything. For sure. Mm -hmm. So thank God I, you know, had my head on straight and I took care of the stuff in the classroom. And I was the only player from that team of 20 something players that transferred that year to a d1 university the only one even the sophomores some went to maybe one or two went to like cal state la or they went to some like d2 schools or like naia schools but i was the only one so that was like an, a huge accomplishment for me at the time so that gave me a lot of confidence that you know what after this huge you know humbling you know experience for it wasn't even that long of an experience i am like more motivated and determined than ever to to keep shining now you know what you said okay the accomplishments right i think when we're have one mindset in a position where like we're around all of our academy teammates who our accomplishment would be d1 that's like step number one right and step number two is obviously you go to the school then you become a starter and then you become a four-year starter so that's technically through that mindset through that frame it's kind of like those are the accomplishments uh -huh. so for you it sounds like at what point did you realize my accomplishments may not be as not promising, but like as, uh, as much as I would have wanted them to be like, as right. I can't find the word for some reason, but right. I know you, you, do, you know what I'm saying? Though. So like, what, what was mean. that change? The mindset change? Honestly, it was just going through that experience. It was me coming in probably with a bit of pride, a bit of ego, and then being really grounded throughout that experience to understand that what, what gives me the right over all these guys. Some of these guys have you know wives and kids that I'm playing with and like, they're fighting just as hard as I am. Like, why, sh you know, why should I start over them? I have to earn this. And so it really gave me the experience that I needed that kind of um, helped shape my mentality. Not completely, but definitely in a way that helped guide me through the next stage of my career, which was going to a D1 university. Now I'm going to now I'm going to be competing against, you know, the best of the best. You know what I mean? Especially UC Davis. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't say that, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so definitely going through that process definitely helped shaped how I viewed my goals. And, you know, even though, like you said, it's, it, those accomplishments, you know, maybe looking a year or two prior, if I were to look at one of my accomplishments within the next year or two, it's probably goals that maybe I didn't really have set in my mind at the time but after going through that humbling experience you know my goals and ambition and it changes a little bit and so it, it got a little bit more grounded for sure 
Okay, so you go to UC Irvine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think still to this day, you guys still hold probably like some of the best records in your in your three seasons there, mm-hmm. where I think you guys made it senior year. You guys beat us in the final, unfortunately, of the Big West tournament. Not Big West tournament. It's the semifinal of the Big West tournament. Mm-hmm. And then you guys ended up winning it. You guys go all the way. I think you guys even beat UNC at home in the round mm-hmm. of 16. And then you guys lose in the quarterfinal. I think it was to Maryland. Yeah. But you guys had the better chances, I know. But they had That's Zach it. Steffen. So that was a whole that was a whole scenario. I'm just a Man City guy. <laughs> just a Man City guy. <laughs> uh, so what was, your, what was your time like at Irvine? And, and I will get to... I mean, it's it's poetic. Your your goal in the Big West tournament is semifinal against none other than UC Riverside, where you did score a did. banger. Which we'll put, I'll put it over the video here, but <laughs> scored a banger. So I guess your first year and what was that moment like, where you were kind of just like, oh, man, I, I need I need to relish this because right, yeah. First year, my sophomore year in UC Irvine. Thankfully, the team was was already pretty good coming into that year in 2011 it was a challenging year because i had just transferred in and so obviously you know being a transfer you still have to prove yourself to the guys that are already there and you know somewhat established and so now there's a larger gap between the youngest guys on the team and and the oldest guys on the team that i wasn't used to so now i had to get used to the physicality i had to get used to um, the speed of play you know the different style whereas community college ball was a little bit more individual flair mm. and it wasn't as structured where now there's a little bit more tactical now 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 you need to be better within this dynamic and so you have to you have to adapt adapt or die essentially and so uh i did really well i think i started and played nearly every minute my my sophomore year and, and i was playing at the six still wow um so it was a transition straight from mount sac as a six to a six now playing D1 ball against in that year we played a lot of ranked teams and so it was a really really good experience that year we ended up winning the Big West conference we ended up winning Big West tournament we got a first round bye into the NCAA tournament and that and then that first round we played a home match in the round of 32 against St. Mary's and we lost in a golden goal in overtime it was like oh, yeah. uh, that was supposed to be our year. We had so many seniors like playing really good football, and like they had all this prospect of going professional after. And then it was a disappointing loss that ended our NCAA tournament pretty early, and so that was tough. So after all those seniors left, the next year we had one senior, and it's one of my best friends now still, named Everett Pitts, and we had we had a good team. But we just had so many things wrong. Like, because I had transferred, I I didn't make sure I had enough classes that fit within a certain major, so I couldn't even declare for a major. So I had to I had to miss the first five games of the season to take classes through the summer to make sure I, w- I was eligible. Guys had injuries, and at once every time someone important to the lineup would would come back from an injury, another guy or two would go out of the lineup because of injuries. So it was it was a hectic year. So my junior year was pretty bad to say the least, unfortunately. But like I said, we only had one senior that year. So after Everett couldn't play anymore, by the time it came to my senior season, we just kept everyone pretty much that we had and just maybe added a few other guys. So we still had a good bond and chemistry, even though we had a bad season together. And so that senior season going into it, I'm like, we are not having that season again. I remember at one point in that summer, prior to that senior season, I was playing on three teams, bro. I would go do a UC Irvine camp for little kids. After that, I would drive straight to Chivas USA practice with my teammate Marco and another teammate Chino. And we would go drive all the way to L.A. from from Orange County, go play, come back home. The next day we would play with a different team. Uh, it was it was hectic, but Jeez. we were determined On to a mission. boss it mm-hmm. senior season. It was our senior season. We had to do well. We had to redeem ourselves for our junior season, which was really disappointing. And so senior season came around and we were you know, breaking records were undefeated for all these games, you know, the most, uh, the longest winning streak for all these games. We won the conference again. We won the tournament again. We got to the NCAA tournament. We got a first round bye. So everything was happening pretty much the same way as my sophomore year, 
But now it's like, I'm a senior. I, we cannot mm-hmm. get out of the first round on, you know, a disappointing exit like we did my sophomore year. So we host University of North Carolina at home. You know, we're one of the top ranked teams in the tournament, maybe like 12 or something or something like that. And it comes down to the final seconds of that match. A cross gets sent into their box. One of our players uh, kind of tries to take a touch and settle it down. He ended up uh, getting poked out away from him and lands to my friend Chino, who takes a touch, volley, two seconds on the clock, oh, hits the back of the net. <laughs> it was the craziest <laughs> ending to a game I've, I've probably ever been a part of. Everyone's celebrating in the corner. The game's over, essentially. There's no you know, added time mm-hmm. after that. So after they, they, you know, get the kickoff and resume the match, they kick it and it's over. And so we made the sweet 16. Uh, we go to Maryland. That was like, that was a tough trip. We go from beautiful Southern California to like snowing Maryland weather. And so we get there and we still have a lot of belief, but Maryland's one of the top teams. Maryland's, you know, always a good, always a good program that's competing year after year. We did really well considering the circumstances, but all it took is one mistake that cost us the match, and we lost one nil and Sweet Sixteen uh, exited, and it was over. Season's yeah. over. Yeah. And so that that was tough to swallow, but. Um, making it that far was was a really good accomplishment. I'm so proud of. I mean, again, you turned uh, the program was good. I know Irvine prior to you getting there, yeah. they were good. But I think when you guys were there, like right. your stretch of Marco Chino, uh, uh, Kike or Enrique yeah. Cardenas, like those guys, you guys had a really really good team. That every time we played you guys, it was just kind of like, oh crap, okay, anything anything could happen. Right. One of those guys can have a, a go off and have one of those games. So I think right. that's also an interesting look when you are a freshman sophomore. Not as much pressure, mm-hmm. but I think those are the experiences that you have that when it's the the team kind of turns a little bit and now right. you are the captain or you're the leader, uh-huh. that wisdom and that perspective allows you to come to these new experiences and now say, you know what, maybe I had some regrets in the past, but it's not oh, going to happen again. For sure. And so, again, you have those that uh, was the word I was looking for earlier was ambitious accomplishments. Right. But the ambition obviously now maybe shifts back to, OK, I've seen that I can be someone who leads a team yeah. or be a part of a team now where we get to the quarterfinal or yeah, quarterfinal of the NCAA tournament. I'm playing against these, you know, top guys. I'm performing well. So now is your mind shifting again now from those accomplishments that may have been a little bit uh, of an ego kick, but now, now you're shifting them back up to more ambitious and saying, Oh crap. Okay. Now it's time to, to shift it to, to overdrive and become a pro. Right, right. Definitely. You know, those things start to creep in the back of your head. You know, once you start accomplishing these things and you're part of a, a team who is doing really well and, and, you know, not trying to blow smoke up, up my own, you know what, but you know, you're an important part of that team. So you're an important part of that success. And so obviously my senior season, you know, guys start to get interest from agents who want to reach out and represent them. I didn't really have too much. I would say, Interest. I would say interest, yeah, just interest, general interest from clubs or agents in general. Were you so surprised? Not really, because I've never been a player that, like I said, is is shiny. I'm not flashy mm. in that sense. I've always been able to be successful within the games, but it's, it's a, a lot of subtlety about my play, which has allowed me to be successful because it's subtle. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so especially as, as as a player now who in my senior season I made the transition back to center back because that senior from the prior season was our main center back ever yeah and so we we changed our system in a way where we can actually build out of the back and so me having um, the qualities that I have it was going to be more beneficial to the team for me to move back to center back and, you know, to a certain extent, I'm like, oh, man, I kind of miss playing the six. But you know what? This is my senior season. And if this is going to help the team, I'll play center back. Let's go. And so it ended up working out. Me and Marco were playing center back side by side, actually. And he's a natural right back. So ultimately, just even speaking about this in general, being able to interchange positions it was extremely helpful for me in my career. Because one, it shows your versatility. And two, it helps you understand those positions a bit better to to be able to help those players and allow them to succeed as well. So 
as a center back now, you know, someone who when MLS scouts go to, you know, watch games of these top college programs, I don't stand out. So I don't have a bunch of blogs being written about me or but guess what? My my team out of the maybe like, I don't know, 18 or 20 games you play in a in a season, we had 10 clean sheets. We had one of the best goals against average, I think, in the country. And I had I had nothing being written about me. I wasn't even getting put up for like you know the Big West first team, whatever. And we won everything, and so it wasn't it wasn't almost like a humbling experience again. It wasn't like I was being grounded, but it was you know okay, so be it. You know, I don't I don't need agents, whatever. I can do this on my own. I've been doing it on my own. I can do I can keep doing it on my mm-hmm. own, even though I've had help people <laughs> help me along the way, sure. of course, but. Um, and so it came time for the process of the draft. Uh, Marco got drafted first round. Everyone's pumped for him. I was hoping after that super draft, there's a supplemental draft, that maybe a team would pick me up. We'll see what happens. The last person got picked, and I didn't get picked up. But prior to the draft, there's combines being had by these MLS teams. Seattle Sounders had one in Vegas. This is like a big one where they invite like I want to say like at least 100 players that they've identified throughout the country. So I went to Vegas. You get put on a random team with a bunch of random players and <laughs> you got to somehow succeed again. You know what I'm saying? It's this process. It's it's crazy. You spend a couple of days in Vegas. You play, you know, for a few mornings and then that's it. You go home. And so don't hear anything from from them after really. Similar process, but maybe not as hectic, was me getting invited to LA Galaxy Combine, which we remember each other from, and something we spoke about already, but that's another process where, again, you have to try to stand out and and look good without looking like you're showing off and you're just an individual, and so I went through that process. I probably did well enough because after the supplemental draft had ended, I got calls probably within a half an hour from one another from someone from the front office from Seattle inviting me to preseason and someone from the front office from Galaxy inviting me to preseason. But at the time, Galaxy was going to be the only team that was going to introduce a kind of reserve team into the USL league system. And so I'm thinking, you know what, this is probably for their USL team. And if Seattle's calling me, they don't have a USL team. This is for sure for their MLS team. And so me, as someone who was like excited, anxious, had no experience through the process, was thinking, and not that I would change my decision now, but well, I'm going for it. If an MLS team is interested in me, I'm going for MLS. I'm not going to maybe go to USL as like a backup. No, I'm going to go for it. And so I ended up, (laughs) <laughs> actually well i i ended up going to seattle telling seattle yeah i'm gonna come i'm gonna go to their preseason and then i ended up telling galaxy like i don't know something stupid something like oh i'm actually gonna go to seattle's preseason but like i'll let you know if it doesn't work out <laughs> something like <laughs> immature and just like only an inexperienced like yeah. rookie would say something like that so immediately burn a bridge but you're handling everything on your own On my own. So all the interactions is just me. I don't have anyone guiding me through this process. And so me thinking right after my senior season, well, no one's talking about me. Well, I went from not an extreme low, but kind of a low because you're like, well, the prospects of me maybe being able to be pro because no one's talking about me are pretty low. And then extreme high when you get two calls within a half an hour after the draft inviting you to preseason, which... Let's face it, most of the guys that get drafted, it's just a preseason invite anyways. Mm-hmm. And so it went to an extreme high. And now now you're, now you're you have emotion. And so I'm not even thinking about, you know, how every word that I say to someone, you know, might be interpreted in, in a different way. And so, of course, whatever I told Galaxy was interpreted in a way that was like disrespectful, this mm-hmm. and that. I burned a bridge immediately without even knowing it. It's the first bridge, maybe the only bridge I've ever burned in my career. (laughs) So, and so after um, after I ended up going to Seattle, I went to preseason there, and it was like a huge shock to me. This is like a real professional environment. I remember the first couple days, you're just doing testing. You know how you do the 
you know, the 5-10-5 test, or you do like the 40 meter sprint test, or the, you know, your vertical jump test, things like that. And I'm not athletic. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like ranking, and they would, the thing was, they would post your, your scores, and not rank you, but essentially, it would go in but descending order to like <laughs> the lowest scores of Guys, everything. Guys, when are we going to do the intangible <laughs> test? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Can we do something on character maybe soon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I was like in the bottom five, like in everything. <laughs> and so that was tough. And then, and so at the time, Seattle was one of the best MLS teams. Not that they aren't now, but they were one of the best teams in the league. They had top pros. Obafemi Martins. Guys, you know, that were experienced in the league that were like MVPs, like Chad Marshall, anchor of this, uh, of their back line. You had Clint Dempsey, DeAndre Yedlin. Like they had players at the time. This was Seattle probably at their peak before they were shipping players off to Europe and whatnot. And so to me, I'm like a rookie coming into this, no agent, no one guiding me through this trial process, essentially. I somehow just keep making it from week to week. I'm just doing well enough to keep going. And so I go to Tucson with the team, and we play preseason tournament against other MLS teams in, in preseason. Every couple of days you have a match, but within those couple of days you're just training, maybe doing double days and whatnot. And so you're kind of trying to settle in and get comfortable with guys now that the numbers have kind of dwindled down to something that kind of resembles more or less of what a roster would look like. Get more comfortable, but I'm just I'm just not getting a certain vibe from especially the assistants. And at the time, Ziggy Schmidt was was the manager, and he's very like kind of hands off, just kind of observes. He doesn't run any of the training sessions. He's a manager, he just kind of manages. And so it got to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm not getting the vibes from maybe one or two of the assistants. So I'm not sure I'm doing well. And I'm not sure they like me. And so I got to the point where near the end of our time in Tucson, we were playing our final game. It was literally the last day. We played like a morning match. We were, we were going to fly back out to Seattle that afternoon or evening. And I just, for some reason, my intuition was telling me that Okay, I'm probably going to get cut. This is the day they're making decisions. I'm probably going to get cut. Whatever. Screw it. I'm just going to go out here and just at least try to enjoy myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So usually throughout this trial process, whenever you're playing these preseason matches, they're, you know, three 30-minute thirds, if you want to call it. This last day was like a standard 90-minute 245s. And so I played the whole second half. And that was like the most minutes I had played. I only played 30 minutes all those prior matches. And I did maybe okay in those matches. In this last match, I just bossed it. I was playing out of my mind. I was doing all the head fakes. <laughs> I was getting back in my zone. You know what I mean? I, it's not that I was like, I don't care anymore. Because no, I did I, care. If I'm going to go down, I'm going to do it on my terms. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I kind of had that mentality and that approach going into it. You know, I'm, I might as well have fun with that. I might as well actually show this is who I am. I don't care what you're looking for in a center back. I'm going to stop trying to fit this box that you guys have created for what a center back is and what you're looking for. And mind you, they had drafted two players in the super draft who are both center backs on generation Adidas contracts. So obviously looking back in reflection, I'm like, yeah, there's no way they were going to sign me, <laughs> you know? Probably that's one thing you could have researched before <laughs> right. telling Galaxy. No now type of research. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, you know, what? I'm going to go back and just, or, or I'm going to I'm gonna go out here and essentially just be myself. I'm going to stop trying to fit this box that you have and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be myself. And so I killed it. I was being cheeky, being creative, playing out of the back. I was finding ways not to go back to the keeper and keep progressing my team and applying pressure on them. And my positioning was excellent. My, you know, my ball recoveries, my my ability to re retain possession after we've pressed and the other team has kicked a long ball and either a cheeky flick back to the keeper or being able to bring it down under pressure and find a way to, to distribute the ball out to someone without pressure, etc. And so the game ended. I played my best football on the last day. 
literally probably half an hour later after you're done showering and changing mm. they they tell all the guys that are essentially on trial that okay one by one essentially you guys are going to come into the room and one of the the main assistant coach is gonna come have a chat with you tell you your fate exactly so i ended up going into the room they tell me already what i had already known they were probably gonna say and so it was what it was i wasn't that hurt by it just because i've already anticipated it and so by the time i left the room i'm walking back through the hallway of this kind of locker room building area and i passed by ziggy schmidt in the hallway i didn't have too many interactions with him up until that point and so he called me by my first name which was like which is already like, oh my God, I'm like, wow. <laughs> like, oh, you know who I am? Feel special. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And so he was like, look, Tarek, like, we actually really liked you, not only just like as a player, but, you know, all the guys liked you as well. But unfortunately, we don't have a reserve team at the moment. We're not planning on bringing one into the USL system until maybe next year. Um, otherwise, we would have kept you. But essentially letting me know that he rated me to an extent at which he saw something in me. And that gave me a lot of confidence. So actually, I left that being cut process like full of confidence. I had I had guys like DeAndre Yedlin and a guy named Brad Evans who used to go to UC Irvine mm-hmm. like years prior to when I arrived. Actually, tell me I did great. These guys had just come back from national team camp. I think probably January camp or something. And so they were in the stands on the last day watching, essentially. And so being able to perform really well and show out my best football in front of these guys and have them kind of give me compliments when they mm-hmm. didn't need to was um, everything really reassuring. Needed. Yeah, everything you needed to keep pushing forward with it. For sure, for sure. So that was my experience there into the pro world. And I was like, you know what, I can, I can make it. If I just keep pushing, work harder, I can, you know, really make a career out of this, essentially. Did you have any regrets that the last 45 minutes that you played were your best and you should you should have just been doing that the whole time? Or oh, yeah. you wouldn't have changed too much because, like, you felt what you felt and you reacted how you reacted? It's tough, but, I mean, obviously through reflection, I would like to believe that, man, if I had just come in with that approach that I was on the last day, ah, oh, man, maybe I would have signed with the team and so... Now I'm thinking about it in a little bit of um, regretful terms, but I have no regrets. I think it, it was meant to happen the way it happened. Everything prior to that point in my career, um, through every stage, it was almost meant to be. Like for me to go to Mount Sac, for me to not get my scholarship from UC Riverside, for me to only end up going to UC Irvine, who's a better school than UC Riverside, in a better location, better academics, better program only to play them in the semifinals of my first year at UC Irvine of the Big West tournament only to score my first collegiate goal against them and to beat them and knock them out and and to celebrate in front of that coach who (laughs) who took my scholarship offer away without any explanation only to go and actually make a really you know good collegiate career shoot I won a state championship my freshman year my sophomore year I won my conference tournament uh, won the conference, made it to the NCAA tournament. My forget about my junior yeah, I was gonna year. Say, we'll skip, we'll skip my senior year, pretty much um, the same thing as my sophomore year, only better. And so, like, I had already made these amazing accomplishments after you know all these trials of adversity. So after leaving Seattle, I it didn't feel like I was taking a step down. I was it was kind of like priming me for the next step, essentially. You know what I mean? Mm. So and the next step. You are negotiating your own. Well, first off, you you fly yourself up, which is a theme, by the way. I've been talking to right. a lot of like USL guys and like guys who um, have those aspirations, and uh-huh. they don't like no one ever gives them enough credit for taking the initiative, going places on their own dime. Right. And no one ever like gives you that money back, and no uh-huh. one ever says, "Hey, here you go. Uh, you made the team now. Let's give you this uh, this money back for the flight." Right. So you flew yourself out. Well, how did the OKC things? I know you were there for a little bit, but you flew yourself out to OKC. Was it for a trial or was it for like, hey, I'm going to sign? Or what was the situation? So the situation at the time was OKC wasn't a team. They were a brand new organization. They had just entered the USL as a brand new team. So at the time, they didn't really have any players signed. And so they were coming into the league as an affiliate club 
to an MLS team. And what that meant at the time was they had a connection, probably more so just regional than anything, where an MLS team who didn't have any USL team or any reserve team at the time, because the reserve league had essentially folded prior uh, to the USL being more established, they would send players down on loan, essentially who needed minutes, things of that nature. I saw some opportunity there in Oklahoma City. I had only really entertained it because there was like a West Coast scout from Sporting KC that was kind of located in SoCal who would come watch games that I would play over the summertime, this and that. So I had somewhat of a, enough interactions with the guy to be like, you know, what, maybe maybe it could work out. And so he had told Oklahoma City coach about me because he was obviously within the scouting team of Sporting KC. I ended up going to Oklahoma City. I paid for my own flight. Thankfully, they paid for the hotel. At the time, you know, as a senior college student, you don't have much money at all. (laughs) And so a couple hundred bucks is a lot of money. It is. And so I go fly out to Oklahoma City. I never been to the Midwest like that. At this time, it's like February. Cold. Going to this other trial. I was just at Seattle Sounders. So now it's almost that process of like being humbled again and you came from this extremely professional environment where everything was given to you You had three meals a day that were like gourmet amazing meals you had all this per diem this and that man i probably paid for my flight with a per diem from like one day (laughs) you know what i mean and so and so you go through this process again thankfully there weren't too many players that were probably willing to go to oklahoma city But after maybe a week long trial there, they end up wanting to offer me a contract. So I'm speaking with the head coach. It's pretty informal. It's like after training, he's like, so I think we want to sign you. Like, do you have an agent? I'm like, no. Like, okay, well, what do you want? (laughs) Bro, like, what? Is this how the process works? Like, what the heck? And so ultimately, I was like, look, I'm going to talk to my family. Um, I have some interest from Orange County which I just, I bullshit at the time. I, I don't I don't think I had interest. I just saying that. And so I ended up going home. We're kind of talking back and forth throughout the process. And ultimately, we ended up settling on a deal, which at the time, I'm like, damn, that's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, but it was enough for me at the time to be like, you know what, I'm comfortable with this. I think I'm ready to step out of my comfort zone, get away from home, literally out in the Midwest, almost in the middle of nowhere, and signed my first professional contract without having an agent, really. So I was just kind of looking over everything, having my dad look over (laughs) the the terms and agreement and whatnot. He's looking over the terms like, damn, this this is a professional contract, (laughs) you sure? I've seen some of those. I've seen some of those. They are very hard. You're like, is someone like teasing me here? Like, are you joking around with this? No. Right. It's real. And mind you, this is 2014. So the USL wasn't as as established and didn't have this structure and financial backing Mm. as it does now. So contracts at the time in 2014 were pretty shoddy, Mm -hmm. I would say. And so all things considered, it was actually okay at at the time, considering what other guys were on. So I ended up in Oklahoma City, and that was my first year as a professional. And it was definitely a challenge. One, not only that I didn't have my friends and family by me anymore so i was definitely immersed in this professional world but like being at a club that's brand new didn't have a lot of structure and stability to it it was tough because there was a lot of things that came into the picture that i had just had not experienced in my time you know the business side of things that was completely brand new to me so it was a whole new ball game for sure the players getting loaned in from the skc system is that right that's that's tough too because you can train extremely well all uh-huh. week and then the weekend comes and when well, you know maybe not in the that's starting 11 but yeah hey you're bumped off the team sheet right like that's that's got to be a it's a new experience that right. you ha, no one's taught me how or given the resources or tools to fight back from those things for it's sure kinda like take it right and that happened so many times and it was all these instances and in where it was like damn i'm working so hard every single day before training during training after training and these guys would just fly in the day before the game and just start the next day. Like they didn't, they didn't train, they didn't earn this. And so that was like, that was probably one of the toughest aspects of my first year as a pro was just understanding the mental side of the game and how to be able to 
shift your mentality to be able to maintain a good work ethic, maintain the ability to still be a good teammate. But at the same time, now I'm playing with another chip on my shoulder, even more so now probably. Now it's like, this is my job. I have to make it. I don't have anything to fall back on at the moment. This is my only focus at the moment. And so that was tough to navigate through for sure. Being immersed into that world where sometimes <laughs> it wasn't about merit, really. You know, if the coach likes you, if he's the same nationality as you, mm. that person might get the opportunity. And it is what it is. If a club wants to send a player and, and say you need to play him, the club has to play him. Like, unfortunately, that's that's part of it sometimes, you it's know, out of your control at that point. Right. Exactly. So that year, I remember specifically, I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to make it a point. I'm going to make him see without even looking at me that I'm the hardest worker here. Bro, I would show up to training like a madman, like every time, even if we're doing a technical drill just to warm up, I would be on it as if this, as if I was in mid-season form, World Cup (laughs) final, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like the kids you hate to play against when you're doing a preseason game. Yo, chill. You know what I mean? Yeah, relax, bro, relax. (laughs) That was me. I was Mm. like on, you know, max speed all the time. You couldn't turn me down and you couldn't essentially deny me an opportunity to play. Everyone saw it. Every player saw it. So if the coach didn't play me at at some point, then he it would be so obvious the reason why, you know, he's not playing me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to give him an inch, and I didn't. And ultimately, even though the seasons were, were pretty shortened compared to how it is now, it's only 20-something matches, I ended up playing and starting maybe like, I don't know, 12 to 14, maybe half of them, I would say. But man, I really, really earned those minutes. And came time to the end of the season. We didn't have a great season. Only a few teams really qualified for playoffs. There was only like 12 to 14 teams in the league at the time anyways. So only a couple teams made it. (laughs) And so it was hard to make playoffs. And we ultimately didn't make playoffs. And right before the season had ended, I was on a one-in-one deal, one-year guaranteed, one-year option. Um, The option deal was whatever. It was okay. I remember prior to the last game of the season, it was actually going to be in Irvine at home. Uh, the coach was telling me, uh, we'd like you to want to pick up your option. And so it kind of felt good, even though all these other things were happening. It just feels good to be wanted in general, essentially. And so finish that game, go back to Oklahoma, getting ready for exit meetings. I go into my exit meetings and you know I'm anticipating what he had already told me. And then he goes, sorry, uh, Tarek, we're just we're going to move on and we're not going to pick up your option. Uh, thanks for uh, your contribution. That was that. Handing me my jerseys. I walked out like, what the hell just happened? I don't even want to be here. And now you tell me you didn't want me? <laughs> like, what the heck? And so I left that experience like, damn, man, this business sometimes is cruel. And it was like, it was my first experience into the world of like, you know what? Nothing's guaranteed until it's signed and sealed. You know what I mean? And so it, that was something that I'm glad I learned earlier on because it, it made me, not that I would say maybe more guarded and less trustworthy of people. A realist. Right. But it made me a realist. I didn't live in fantasy world anymore. Now I'm like, okay, this is a business. I'm just an asset. If one day they could say, you know, I'm their favorite player, and the next day they say, you know what, Mm, we don't see him um, being part of this, you know, whatever anymore. So you can control. I think that's the. I think the moral of what I'm hearing so far is control what you can control. So at the end of the day, you can write the narrative versus being at the mercy of these people. For sure, for sure. And you know, even though they came to this decision, it's like, well, I'm not gonna let this guide what happens to me next you know why can't my next move be a step up mm. you know what i mean get stronger stronger every day get stronger as, as as we go like my mount sac performance mm-hmm. coach used to tell me so i keep that in my back of my mind for everything now and so i left oklahoma city and then it was okay don't have an agent i don't have you know anyone reaching out to me so how am i going to navigate this offseason process again thankfully i had maybe played you know, a match or two in my off seasons with 
um, different teams, including like Ventura County Fusion, who you might know. And so they would always play off-season matches against some, sometimes MLS teams that would come out to, let's say, Southern California for their preseasons and whatnot. And so over the course of the off-season, I'm training, I'm just staying ready for whatever happens, trying to make connections and, and, and get contacts and whatnot. And I go to Ventura County Fusion Combines and I make some connections and that 2014 season, Sacramento Republic had had won the USL. And so after that season ended, well, I'm like, well, shoot, Sacramento's in California. I would love to stay in just California. After I went to the Ventura County Fusion Combine, this connection that I made within Ventura, uh, he kind of connected me to Sacramento. And Sacramento was interested in inviting me out to their invite-only like combine slash trial. And on an almost guaranteed basis of like, let's just make sure you're fit, sharp, and you get along with guys, well, whatever. And then we'll probably offer you a contract. So literally after I made a decision, I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to go to drive up to Sacramento. Within the couple of days prior to me actually going there, I get a call, random call. And it ends up being the new head coach for a new organization in the USL in Louisville, Kentucky. And the coach was a man named James O'Connor. And Orlando, who I'm pretty sure that was their last season in the USL, who was moving up to the MLS, had uh, James as like a player coach at the time. So James came to Louisville. He's, he already watched me play because when I was in Oklahoma City, I played at Orlando. Oh, my God. I made this blunder, which oh, yeah. was like probably the worst of my rookie season where I just was overplaying out of the back, you know, still trying to be who I was, you know, this is, this is the type of player that I am, you know, I'm able to play out of pressure. And so I overdid it in one instance that cost us a goal. And ultimately it may have cost us the game. We still conceded another goal after that, but I still actually had a really good game except for that one instance. So <laughs> it was, it was tough to swallow at the time. It was a tough experience to be able to deal with mentally afterwards. But James had watched me and play that, play that game against him. And so he obviously saw enough in me that he liked me. So he called me and he, he left me a voicemail and I called him back. He wanted to offer me a contract immediately. I was like, dang, is the first time I don't have to go on trial? Oh my God, I love this. I was like, but to be honest with you, James, like, I have interest from Sacramento. I'm going to go train up there for a few days. Um, and then they're going to offer me a contract. So I'm not sure. Non-committal. Let's just, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I can't commit, but he was like, okay, I understand. Like if, you know, I can understand Sacramento just won it. I mean, from California and you'd like to stay there, this and that. I was all, we were open and honest with each other. He was like, but just know if you go to Sacramento and things don't work out, and you end up calling me again, I won't give you as good as a deal as I just gave you right now. Mm. So I was like, oh. He damn. knew the game. He knew the game. I know. And <laughs> me, I didn't have, I didn't have, I was my own agent at the time. <laughs> I was like, damn, that was good. Damn. James, let me talk to my people real <laughs> I'm quick. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I ended up just, you know, sticking with my initial decision of wanting to go Sacramento. I went to Sacramento. Went to this trial combine, performing really well every day. I was actually getting close with some of the guys even on the team. We were hanging out. We were going out to eat together. They were talking to me as if like, you oh, made the team. I'm for sure signing. Preki's signing you. Preki, the coach at the time. And I finished the last day. I kind of let my guard down. I wasn't as anxious through that process. I'm sure you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. Stressful, anxious, always worried about, you know, do they like me? Do they not like me? Whatever. After that last day, Again, it's those one-on-one -on -one kind of exit meetings. My turn to go. I get called, talk to Preki one-on-one in kind of like a side room. And he goes, 